اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا و حبیبنا حبیب اله العالمین محمد و علی آله الطیبین الطاهرین المعصومین المنتجبین Before we continue with the du'a, du'a of Abu Hamza al-Thumali, let me mention one hadith which is related to our topic. The hadith is in Kitab al-Khisal of Shaykh al-Saduq rahmatullah alayhi, which says, إن الله أخفى أربعة في أربعة. الله سبحانه وتعالى has hidden four things inside four other things. أخفى رضاه في طاعته. فلا تستصغرن شيئا من طاعته. فرب ما وافق رضاه وأنت لا تعلم. He has hidden his Rida, which is pleasure, what all of us seek. We all of us seek to to, uh, to reach to a point where Allah is pleased with us. He has hidden that in his obedience. So nothing of his obedience you should take lightly. Because that one obedience that you take lightly might conform with his pleasure. And you miss it. It's one thing. أخفى سخطه في معصيته فلا تستصغرن شيئا من معصيته فربما وافق سخطه وأنت لا تعلم He has hidden his wrath in his disobedience So do not take any act of disobedience lightly because that act of disobedience that you take lightly may exactly fall under that category of wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you don't know what in fact the hadith is telling us that when you are dealing with God or when you confront things which are related to God do not take anything related to him lightly because sometimes we, we may not know by one simple act what we are doing to ourselves in terms of good or bad. Different types of obedience. We shouldn't say that, okay, I'm doing this, that's enough. So, for example, I'm doing my duties, my prayers, my fasting. Why should I pay so much sadaqa or do infaq or other things? Why should I help others? Why should I do this, do that? Every field, every field of good acts, we have to take seriously. And on the other hand, every type of evil act we have to take seriously as well, so that we do not fall under the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these two. The third one is, أَخْفَى وَلِيَّهُ فِي عَبَادِهِ فَلَا تَسْتَسْغَرَنَّ شَيْئًا مِنْ أَحَدًا مِنْ عَبَادِهِ فَرُبَمَا أَنْ يَكُونَ وَلِيَّهُ وَأَنْتَ لَا تَعْلَمُ His wali, wali is friend, isn't it? When we talk about awliya, Allah means friends of God. Allah is very zealous about his friends, very zealous. If you bring, befriend with God, if you befriend with God, then you don't know how God shows his support and his blessing for you. Even you, you deal with other people, when you deal with other people, if other people take you lightly, disrespect you or whatever, that would bring his wrath upon them because you are his friend. 
just in our daily interactions, how do we show our affections and our feelings about our friends? Especially if that friendship is a true friendship. Now God is like that with, with regards to his friends. And who is his friend? His friend is someone who is absolutely free of evil or tries to be free of evil. Tries to be free of evil. This becomes friend of God. So, he has hidden his friends in his all human being, all human beings in his creatures. So, do not disrespect any person because that person might be a friend of God. Of course, we are talking about believers certainly because disbelievers cannot be friends of God. And by disbelievers, we mean those who do not believe in God at all, those who do not follow his prophets. So, do not take them lightly, do not disrespect them, because then that one person may be a friend of God, and that will bring you lots of consequences. فلا تستسخرن شيئا من دعائه فربما وافق اجابته وانت لا تعلم and do not take and he has hidden his response in his dua so do not take any dua lightly do not neglect any type of dua because that one single dua that you neglect of course, I want to talk about the meaning of this and the relation to Dua Abu Hamza now. That single Dua that you neglect, it might be the Dua which meets the response of Allah and His fulfillment. Then, and you don't know. You don't know about it. And you just neglect that. Now, what does this mean? Do not take any type of Dua lightly. If you look into this Dua of Abu Hamza, you see, Imam Ali Salam brings different expressions, makes different approaches, brings different excuses. From different sides, he tries to approach God. Maybe, maybe, that one approach that he's making is the one which would meet the ajaba and response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very important. We have to try every door. We have to try every single dua so that we meet the ajaba of Allah. And by dua, I have, of course, emphasized this several times and I do emphasize it tonight as well. By dua, I mean something that we call from our heart. Dua is different from recitation of the Qur'an. Of course, recitation of the Qur'an, you have to know, understand the meaning. But even if you do not understand the meaning, the very recitation has a sawab. Because that recitation in Arabic would keep the whole tradition, the whole literature alive. And you convey it to future generations. It would be it will thrive and go on and on, move during generations. That's very good. Of course, that does not fulfill the mission of the Qur'an, which is guidance. Unless you understand what it says, it would not fulfill the mission of the Qur'an, which is guidance. But it fulfills other missions. That guidance is conveyed to your children, to others. Dua is not like that. That you recite in Arabic and you say, okay, I have done something. Dua should come from your heart. It's very good that we learn Arabic and we can recite the duas in Arabic. However, if we just recite it as, for example, Dua Kumail, we just recite it in Arabic and we don't understand anything about it. Would a rational person say that you have called upon God? No, we haven't called upon God. We just have recited something. So, dua should come from the heart. And that's why it's important these different types of <coughs> different traditions of A'ima which have come to us as these treasures of dua, 
we have to try to call upon God through them. It's very important, through them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call me, I respond. And calling, of course, has its own very clear meaning. That you have to call from your heart. Call me and I respond. We do not know how to call him. That's our problem. We do not know. We are not intimate enough to start praising, to start, to ask things. Now we'll come to the request that Imam has. Up till now we have talked about different approaches of Imam in Dua Abu Hamza. But what request he has, we'll come to that inshallah. And we see how beautiful he puts his requests. Long, long list of requests Imam put there. It's not only a monajat, it's not only whispering with God, not asking anything, no. There is a long list of requests. And at the end, very beautifully and very cleverly, the Imam says that, give me whatever I asked, and you add to it those things that I forgot to ask you. So everything, I want everything, I want every good thing. Give me all that I asked you, and you add from your own knowledge, whatever I forgot, I neglected, I don't know. There are things that which are very good, very good for me, but I don't know. So you add it to me, for, for me as well. We'll come to that. However, the, the, all these different approaches, which, of course, tonight we finish the different types of approaches, and from tomorrow, inshallah, we go to the requests of the Imam come from a heart which is quite familiar with Allah. He knows how to call, he knows how to approach, he knows what to invoke. These are very important things. Otherwise, if we, if we knew, we would have just done the same thing. We would have called Allah ourselves. We didn't need to read these du'as. We didn't need that. We would have done it ourselves, but we cannot. Just try it. Sit before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try to call him and say things. You will have a one page list of requests, nothing else. You cannot approach God the way the Imam approaches it. Let me mention one story. You may have heard this before from me. Uh, th there, is, there was a very uh, famous orientalist, Hounley Coban. You probably have heard about him. He was an Orientalist, a French Orientalist, Henri Corbin, who was uh, uh, studying in the field of Shi'i literature and history, and especially Imamology and, and such things. For that purpose, he traveled a lot to Iran, to Qom and Tehran, and he, through Sayyid Hussein Nasr, who probably most of you have heard about him, the, professor in the United States. Through him, he was introduced to Ayatollah Allama Tawatawa Rahmatullahi. And uh, uh, in several journeys that he had to Iran, sometimes they met with Allama Tawatawa in Tehran, sometimes they met in Qom. And uh, there are a couple of books from Allama Tabatabai, which are actually a summary of the discussions he had with Henri Corban, like Shia in Islam and Quran in, uh, in Islam. These discussions were recorded and they came as a book. Usually when they met, Corban started to ask questions about Shia faith, about Shia history, about Shia belief, and Allama Tabatabai responded. This anecdote is recorded in a, in a book about Allama Tabai, Taba Tabai called Mehr Taban. It says that uh, in one of those meetings, before Korban is starting to ask questions, Allama told him, I want to ask you a question before we start. He said, okay, what? He said, uh, uh, you, are a, you are a believer. A Christian. Well, there are some uh, reports that say towards the end of his life, Corban became a Muslim converted to Islam. Maybe. 
one of the people who was present at the deathbed of Corbin says that Corbin at the end confessed Islam. But anyhow, at that time, he was a Christian. Alama told him that, and of course he was a professor of Arabic language, knew Arabic very well. Alama told him that, you are a believer, you believe in God. He said, yes. He said, uh, every believer, every true believer, find moments in their lives that they want to talk to God. They want to approach God. They want to say things to God. But our problem is that because we are usually far away from God, we don't know how to talk to him. We don't know what to tell him. We, especially Muslims, especially the Shias, we have a wealth of literature to us from the Prophet, from our Ayama, which when we want to talk to God, we talk to God through these du'as. You see, again, we talk to God, we talk to God through these du'as. Not that we just recite something. No, we talk to God through these du'as. I want to ask you, I haven't seen anything like these du'a. Not only praise, not only scripture. You don't have anything like this in Christianity. When you f are in these moments, when you find these moments in your heart, how do you talk to God? How do you call upon Him? Now, Corman said something very interesting. He said that uh, in many occasions of my life, I have found these moments. And whenever I find these moments, I read Sahifa Sajjadiya and I cry with it. Sahifa Sajjadiya of Imam Zirul I mean, just take away things about Islam in Sahifa Sajjadiya. Just say this is a sort of whispering, a sort of conversation, or a sort of monologue from a, a human being to the Lord. Any human being. I mean, people of every faith can find this moving. Really, can, they can find it moving. Because it comes from the inner part of human soul, which talks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what you find in Sahih Asajadi. Usually, in Dua Abu Hamza. Usually, when I want to introduce Sahih Asajadi to anyone, I invoke this verse from the Quran in Surah Qaf. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَذِكْرَى لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْبٌ Anyone who has heart will be moved by this. The way Imam tries to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, these different types of approach we find in Dua Abu Hamza. We talked about a couple of them in the last couple of nights. Now, to, tonight I want to uh, mention another field or another avenue which Imam opens towards God. And that's the avenue of hope and the avenue of love. Hope and love. That no matter what you do with me, no matter you respond me, you do not respond me, you want to punish me, you don't want to punish me. My hope would not cease and my love would not finish for you. First of all, let me confess something to you. That if I do not find you, it is my fault, it's not your fault. Because anyone who wants to start journey towards you, find him, find you next to him. You are so close. Someone who wants to travel to you, the distance is so short. It is so short. We think it's long. We think he's far away. 
Well, he himself says, "We are closer to you than the jugular vein." He's so close. And the Imam says, "Anyone who decides to come, a rahil, anyone to, who sets out for a journey towards you, should traverse a very short distance, very short, very close. Just open the eyes. That's all." Of course, eyes of, eyes of the heart. وَأَنَّ الرَّاحِلَ إِلَيْكَ قَرِيبُ الْمَسَافَةِ وَأَنَّكَ لَا تَحْتَجِبُ عَنْ خَلْقِكَ You do not put yourself in a veil from your creatures. You do not hide yourself from them. So why don't we see you? So where are you? Why don't we see you? إِلَّا أَنْ يَحْتَحْجُبَهُمُ الْأَعْمَالُ دُونَ is their actions which take you away from their eyes. They cannot see you. It's because of our acts. Because of our acts, we do not feel his presence. We do not see his hand. We need to go through long, long arguments, discussions, reasoning to say there is a God. Well, you don't need any of this. Just open the eyes of your heart. A mystic was, this is of course a, a parable, not something real. A mystic was saying that, oh God, if you are so beautiful, if so, you are so majestic, why do you hide yourself? Why do you hide yourself? And God replied, oh man, if you are so wise, why don't you open your eyes? Open your eyes. You can see me. I don't hide myself. You have closed your eyes and you say, God, where are you? Where are you? You open your eyes, you see me. You do not go into veil from your creatures. It is their acts which do it. You know what's our difference with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And of course, his progeny, the household. The household. The household has a specific meaning, not, not all his relatives, of course. Like for example, New thought that every every person, every member of his family is his Ahlul Bayt. And that's why when his son was drawn, he said, Qala Rabbi inna ibni min ahli. Well, according to all definitions. Ya, ya Allah, go to any book of any lexicon, go to any dictionary. They say your son is from your Ahlul Bayt, your wife is from your Ahlul Bayt, isn't it? Uh, all are from Ahlul Bayt. And he said, Rabbi inna ibni man ahli wa inna wa'daka al haq wa anta arham al rahim. You said you will save my Ahlul Bayt. So my son was drawn. Qala ya Nuhu innahu laysa min ahlik. He is your son, but not from your Ahlul Bayt. So, when we talk about the Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt, we mean very, very specific members of his family. Now, what is our difference with him? Why did we all the time send Salat to him? Why Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَاءَكَتَهُ يُسَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا سَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Allahumma sallam. Why so much attention to him? Why all concentrate? Every Muslim should concentrate his attention to the Prophet. What is the difference? Was he not a human being like us? Yes, he was. If anyone says Prophet was not a human being like us, he has contradicted Muslim faith. He has contradicted the Quran. He hasn't read the Quran, which Prophet says several times, Innama ana basharun mithlukum, I am just a human being like you. But a human being which had opened his heart and then could see God everywhere. Could feel the presence, not feel the presence, could see the presence of God everywhere. That's the difference. And that makes him that makes him a human being. Because human beings usually don't have this ability or they just destroy this ability. They think that if anyone has this ability, is not a human being. We have to think otherwise. We are not human beings. We have destroyed our human capabilities 
to feel the presence of God, to see the hand of God everywhere. So, أَنَّكَ لَا تَحْتَجُبُ عَنْ خَلْقِكَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَحْجُبَهُ الْأَعْمَالُ دُونَكَ So, it's only our acts which put you away from us. Then we cannot see you. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so pure, so lovable, so clean, that the slightest uncleanliness the slightest impurity would take us away from him. He does not allow impurity to approach him. That's why impure people cannot see him. Every sign they see, they do not believe. Why? Because of the impurity. The impurity doesn't allow it. Okay. This is one thing he establishes. that. Anyone who wants to set out towards you, he's very, you are very close, and you have no veil. Alhamdulillah alladhi la yughlaqu babuh. We praise God that his doors are never closed. Never the doors are closed. It only needs an intention to go there. Okay. From hope, in one expression, the Imam says, فَوَأَزَّتَكَ يَا سَيِّدِي لَوْ انْتَعَرْتَنِي مَا بَرَحْتُ مِنْ بابك. I swear by your dignity, my Lord, if you send me away from your door, he says in one place, سَيِّدِي عَبْدُكَ بِالْبَابَكِ Your servant, servant is on your door. Now, if you want to send me away from your door, if you want to push me away from yourself, ma barahtum in babak, I would not depart. I would not go anywhere. No matter how you insist that I should go, I wouldn't go. It's, this is insistence. This dua is insistence, isn't it? I wouldn't go. Wala kafaftu anta malugak. I would not stop praising you. You may not want to respond to me, but I do not stop praising you. Why? Because of what I've heard about your generosity and your benevolence. It's impossible that you do that. In, in another expression, the same thing he invokes and says, Because my heart testifies. My heart testifies to your benevolence. And how can I forget what you have done to me? Isn't it? How can I forget what you have done to me? What sort of thing I was? Just a drop of water. Look what you have done to me. Should I forget this? I don't forget this. So, in another place, he says, here he mixes hope with love. Look how beautifully. I don't know, sometimes these du'as, when I, when I try to, to read it or to experience it, to say it from my heart, I feel that this is not my cup. This is not something that I can say. Sometimes some du'as, honestly, I say this is not something that I can say. This is not... Is not yet my level. Now look what Imam says here. Elahi, law karantani bil asfa. If you put me in shackles on the day of judgment, law karantani bil asfa. Wa manatani sayba kamen bain al ashad. And in front of all people, you deprive me of your benevolence. You say, this is a deprived servant. This does not deserve anything. And let everyone watch my indecencies, my sins, my evils. Let everyone do that. And command the angels to take me to hell. And bar 
between me and the good people, your good servants. Ma qata'atu raja'i meant my hope will not be cut off from you. Can we say this? The slightest difficulty which comes to us, we lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why I said this is not our cup. This is not our level. This is a different level. This is a different ma'rifah. This is a different knowledge of God. Ma qata'atu raja'i meant وَمَا صَرَفْتُ تَعْمِيلِي لِلْأَفْوَانِ I do not lose hope that you will one day forgive me. You will bring me out. You will honor me one day. مَا صَرَفْتُ تَعْمِيلِي لِلْأَفْوَانِ And this is the, 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 the best part of it. وَلَا خَرَجَ حُبُّكَ مِنْ قَلْبِ Your love never goes out of my heart. Never. أَنَا لَا أَنْسَى عَيَادِكَ عَنْدِي As I said, I never forget what you did to me. Fidar al dunya in the world. And then he says, Rabbi Akhraj Hubba Dunya Min Qalbi, which is a request, we'll come to that later on. In another place he says, Wala in Athaltan al Nar. Okay. Or let, let me read this from the beginning. He says that Elahi Law Sayyidi La in Talaptani Bazunubi. You see different avenues of approach. If you want to put me on the spot because of my sins, I will demand from you your promise of forgiveness. If you want to put me on the spot, if you want to ask me about my meanness, I will demand your benevolence that you have promised. And if you make me enter into the hell, what I will do there? Do you think what? What do you think I will do there in hell? Do you think I shout? Do you think I try to just cry? No. I inform the inhabitants of hell how I love you. I'm going to defy them by telling them how I love you. Those evil people, I'm going to, I'm only going to praise you when you put me there. In another place he says, I mean, it's so beautiful. One cannot think about this soul, how this soul is, how this heart is connected to the Lord. And in the nights of Ihya, in Layal al ghaz when we say, Ilahi bi Ali ibn al Hussein bi Ali ibn al Hussein. When I say this, I always think about these souls, these hearts. Who was this Ali ibn al Hussein? What type of heart he had? What type of love he had for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And of course, when you ask God, and you say, Elahi bi Ali ibn al Hussein bi Ali ibn al Hussein, Allah will, of course, look, pay attention to you. Because this is Ali ibn al Hussein. This is the person that you are invoking. This is the person that you are mentioning to God. Anyhow, And then, he says, Ya Allah, the only thing that I have in this world is my love for you. And I'm, I know that you will not disappoint me, despite this love. I have chosen this from different places, of course, of the dua. Because, as I say, Imam moves from one branch to another branch, one approach to another approach, then comes back to the same approach, then leaves it and goes to another approach. Seeks every avenue to find a way to God. He says, My hope has brought me here. My hope has driven me towards you. So are you going to disappoint me? No, I'm sure you are not going. Oh, my single one, that I never think about anything but you in this world. And hereafter, 
wa alayka ya wahidi akafat himmati my ambition just rests on your door nothing else wa fi ma inda kam basarat raqbati my desire is only with, with what is with you wa laka khalis rajai wa khawfi my pure hope my few pure fear is for you wa bika anasat mahabbati my love knows no one but you you see how he is now approaching from love once he approaches from hope once we have he approaches from love wa bika anasat mahabbati my love knows no one but you so if you drive me away if you push me back where should i go i know no i know no one i know nothing but you ya maulai bidhikrika asha qalbi with your remembrance my heart lives so if i do not remember you i die my heart dies wa bi munajatika barratu alam al khawf anni which is another type of approach <clears throat> Anyhow, there are other things about hope and love that I I just jotted down. We we'll leave this for for time being, and inshallah, from tomorrow night we start to to go to analyze the requests of the Imam, what he now requests. Sometimes, sometimes. Imam Ali Musalam just prays without any request and sometimes they praise and request and of course both are good sometimes they are so absorbed that they cannot ask anything it's just praise sometimes no they go for a request they start praising when the soul is elevated by praise of god by remembrance of god and then they start asking and that's when the blessings come down when the blessing pour upon the soul upon the heart that's when it comes so inshallah from tomorrow night we will analyze the requests of the imam and it's not something that we can afford to request we have to follow the imam in these requests because he is the one who knows what is best for dunya what is best for akhira and you would see you will identify yourself with those requests inshallah from tomorrow night we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the blessing of internalizing these this literature into our hearts and follow inshallah Aim Ali Musalam who had this type of soul so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ali tahirin Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali